So now to our public lecture series and to tonight's lecture. Um, Provocations is a series of public lectures, panel discussions and blogs written by prominent thinkers that seeks to address the grand challenges confronting regional Australia and the world. How can we mitigate climate change and build climate-proof, safe and sustainable communities? Can First Nations ways of knowing, being and doing guide sustainable development? How do we build knowledgeable and inclusive regional communities? This inaugural Provocations Public Lecture will be delivered by Professor Sharon McLeod on the theme, Children Should Be Seen and Heard. The importance of communication so children can thrive. By way of introduction, Sharon McLeod is a Charles Sturt lifer and a source of inspiration to us all. She was recently identified by the Australian Research Magazine as one of nine world leading Australian scholars for her work on audiology, speech and language pathology. The recognition was based on the quality and quantity of her published research in the past five years. But as Sharon would always say, it's the children that matter. She received the same award in 2018, 2019, 2020 and 2022. A remarkable achievement. <laughs> now, probably of more importance to Sharon is the outstanding work she has done as a PhD supervisor and the role she plays on the international stage as a research leader of an international community of researchers, improving the lives of millions of children around the world. It would be difficult to find a research academic that better embraces the university's ethos of creating a world worth living in. I give you Sharon McLeod. Thank you so much, Mark, for inviting me to give this presentation today. When Mark invited me, I just knew I had to say yes. It's such an honour to be able to speak up on behalf of the world's children, to be able to speak up on behalf of people who are often invisible and who are often not heard. Before we began today, you saw some of the images from children from 25 countries who contributed to our um, Children Draw Talking Global Art Exhibition that we have online to really profile children talking to us adults. Sometimes we forget about children. And in fact, I'd like to just begin by Oh, hello, Shukla. I'd like to begin by welcoming one of my colleagues who also um, worked with us in the Children Draw Talking Gallery and our presentations that we had for over 9,000 views in, um, in December. I'd like to ask you to think about, did you see a child today? You did, because you're a mum. I didn't. I haven't seen a child today. Has anybody else not seen a child today? Yeah. How about has anybody who and online as well, have you talked to a child today? Grandparents and parents have. Is there anybody here who doesn't, who isn't a parent, isn't a grandparent and isn't an early childhood educator who's actually seen or talked to a child today? Excellent. Thank you so much for doing that. Children are the future of our world. That's where we're going to end. But they're also our world right now. They're so important. And that's what we're going to be thinking about today. Okay. What I'm going to do is start by thanking the Royal Society of New South Wales for co-sponsoring this event. Um, I was very honoured to attend uh, with Dr Pond at the, um, at the garden party at Government House and it was a really special event. This year 
no, it's last year now, was the 200th anniversary of the Royal Society of New South Wales. So for those of us who have received certificates, and there are others at at CSU who were unable to be here tonight, who also received certificates. I gained this fellowship in 2021, but it's taken us this long to be able to have this ceremony thanks to COVID and other things. So it's a great honour to be part of the Royal Society of New South Wales, a 200 year old institution. Thank you also to Charles Sturt University, who's really supported our endeavours to enable children to thrive. I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. Today, we, if we were looking outside, we could see Walu. We are on the lands of the Wiradjuri people. The children at the Tarai Mac um, preschool have given me permission to use their acknowledgement of country. So please enjoy and listen and learn from our local Wiradjuri children. Thank you so much to the children and staff at the Taro Mac um, Early Childhood Education and Care Centre here in Bathurst. Um, they have also enabled us to use that for our Early Childhood Voices Conference that we had attendees from over 72 countries online, of course, um, in 2020 and in 2022. Um, so if you enjoyed that, um, you can have a look at that on our website too, under ECV 2022 Early Childhood Voices. Two years, three years ago, I was very honoured to be able to represent Australia at the United Nations. I was able to speak up for Australia's children. I was able to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reads, everyone, let me say that again, everyone, including children, has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. 
this Universal Declaration of Human Rights is very old now. And so these sentiments have been echoed through the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Communication is important. In fact, communication as a human right, just because today we have been talking about policy, the freedom to express opinions and ideas is a foundation stone of our democratic society. And these ideas come through in a special issue of a journal that if you Google communication is a human right, you can get free copies of, and there's been hundreds of thousands of downloads. Taylor and Francis said it's their most downloaded um, issue of any journal that they publish, which is really exciting and shows how important communication really is. Now today, we're going to talk about children should be seen and heard. Now, fortunately, for those of you like me who didn't see a child today, we're now seeing a lot of children. So we're going to be thinking of children the rest of the time. And we're going to think about why is communication important so children can thrive? But I also have been given the opportunity to be a bit provocative. And so I'm going to take some of this work a little bit further than some of you and some of you um, who are watching on Zoom have seen me take it before. So let's go. All children have the best start in life to create a better future for themselves and for the nation is the aim of the Council of Australian Governments. So what can we do to make sure that children have the best start in life to create a better future for themselves and also for our nation? Well, I would like to posit that um, communication is the key that can open doors so children can thrive. We have done a lot of work throughout the world, and right now I'm editing an Oxford handbook on children's uh, speech development in languages of the world. And I have 76 different languages and dialects, starting um, Azerbaijani is one of the first ones, and Zulu is the last. But there are many fascinating languages in between. We undertook, um, uh, down the bottom I've got some references, I'm not sure if you can see them all, and, and happy to share any of these with you. But my colleague Kate Crow and I um, apparently broke the speech pathology internet with this article where we analysed 26,000 children from 27 languages to find out what should children be doing when they're four to five so that we've got a sense of how clever children are. By four to five years of age, children are excellent communicators in their home languages, regardless of what language it is, regardless of how many languages they actually speak. And most children in the world speak many more than one language. We are a little bit unusual in Australia. They can be understood by everyone, even strangers, at four to five years of age in their primary languages. They can correctly pronounce almost every consonant, vowel and tone, even in long words. And they can understand and produce sentences, stories and conversations by four to five years of age. And we've found that across languages across the world by drawing on our amazing colleagues who fortunately most of them are bilingual and speak English and can help me with all the languages I don't speak. So I feel a little bit like a personal United Nations pulling that together. But Although communication is a key that can open doors so children can thrive, 25% of Australian and American four to five year, uh, parents of four to five year olds have concerns about how their child talks and makes speech sounds. Now that sounds like a lot. Where did you get that number from, Sharon? Well, actually, we've done a lot of work um, with the Longitudinal Study of Australian Children. We have actually, Charles Sturt University was one of the places that helped develop the questions and Professor Linda Harrison actually was the person in charge of the early childhood information and because her office was this far away from mine and my daughter was exactly the age of the trial group, I knew intimately 
what went into that. So once it came, the data were available to analyse, Linda worked with us, you can see um, Linda's name, to analyse the data that was developed by the Australian Bureau of Statistics to sample 10,000 children in a study that commenced in 2003. So we're pretty sure that this data, these data are representative of Australian children. Now listen to me saying 25% of four to five year, uh, parents of four to five-year-old children were concerned about how their child talks and makes speech sounds. That's a quarter, okay? That's a lot. Does this matter? Does it matter if they were concerned? Well, actually, we then went on to see what happened with these children. Uh, we've done a whole heap of studies. I've just chosen one. When these, they, there were two cohorts of children, so I, I'm analysing the K cohort, for those of you who are into the LSAC study, with 4,329 children that we were able to have all of the data from the children themselves when they were asked from their parents and their teachers um, by eight to nine years of age. When this 25% were compared with the 75% of children whose parents were not concerned at four to five years of age, there was a statistically significant difference now, all your stats people, the outcomes were over and above the effects of sex, age, language background, and socioeconomic status for reading, writing, school achievement, bullying, peer relationships, enjoyment of school, and teacher-child relationships. That's a heck of a lot of issues that these kids are probably having at school, hey? And oh my goodness, one question to parents at four to five, are you concerned about how your child talks and makes speech sounds? Identified these children. Now I'm just gonna show you one more study that we did from NAPLAN data, because NAPLAN is one of those things. Those of you who are in different countries, I know there are a number of people in different countries. It's our national assessment that happens at years three, five, and seven. And they look at children's reading, writing, spelling, grammar, and numeracy, yep, mathematics. The children whose parents were concerned at four to five years of age were consistently, statistically, significantly lower than that 75% of children. They did keep improving, but they never, ever, ever caught up. And that was even in mathematics. Now, for those of you who really think about mathematics at school, there's a lot of language in maths. Okay, John had three apples, George had four bananas. How many pieces of fruit were on the table is actually predominantly a language question, isn't it? It's got a few numbers in there, but not a lot. So for children with communication disability, now you're saying, hang on, you've made a big leap here. How did you get to communication disability from parental concern? Well, we had an Australian Research Council Discovery Grant where we replicated these questions on over a thousand four to five-year-old children in Sydney. And these children, we found 80% of them. So we did speech therapy tests on them. 80% of that 25% actually really could have benefited from speech therapy. So if you do the maths, there's 5% at four to five that are probably fine, but 20% of four to five-year-old children have what a speech pathologist would say, difficulties with communication, and we really could make a difference in their lives at four to five before they get to school. That's a lot of children. Now, keep that 20% in mind, or 25%, because we're going to have a look at what policy doesn't do for these children in a minute. I want to tell you the positive story for now, though. Guess what? For children with communication disability, there are many, many, many evidence-based interventions that support children to thrive. Evidence-based interventions that support children to thrive are early. If we can see kids at two or three or four's getting a bit late, but four is still good. 
that's great. If we wait till they're at school, and I was recently on an Australian government um, expert panel where we looked at the school system and disability, kids were getting early intervention in grade three. That is not early. <laughs> I'm going to put a plug for speech pathologists. I know there's lots of people who help children's communication thrive, but I'm going to say what I am, and that's a speech pathologist. We provide efficient, efficient, because we know the evidence, effective evidence-based assessment, analysis, diagnosis, and intervention. Many people provide great intervention and ideas, but we have done so much work because we have such long waiting lists on how to be fast at it and make it a big change for families. But it doesn't work if we don't work with the families, magnificent educators, many of whom are here tonight, health professionals, friends and community. It's really important to have tiered intervention models. So everybody, every child in the world you need to talk to them. And I'm going to give you some evidence-based ideas about talking to children. Small groups are really important because communication requires other people to talk to. But at times you really and absolutely need individualized intervention. For example, I specialize in unintelligible children, supporting them to be more intelligible. And the absolute minimum I would ever want to see a child to change their tongue patterns is 12 sessions. Now, when you go to a GP to try and get um, the number of sessions, you are given five and that's it. And in a minute, I will show you that a, a randomized controlled trial in America, and sorry, in the UK, showed that if you have six hours of intervention, it's the same as having nothing. So some children require months and even years of intervention to be competent communicators so that their adult lives and their current child lives are really meaningful. So when children don't receive adequate early intervention, there can be a lot of long-term cons consequences on their literacy, their education, their socialization, their behavior. If you can't negotiate your way out of things, you might instead punch someone <laughs> or something else. <laughs> um, relationships are affected, your identity is affected, your well-being is affected, and your chances of employment or chances of being employed at the level of just who you are and who you want to be. And there's so much literature around this. So let's have a think about, well, and there may be people who've joined us who are concerned about children's speech and language. So where can I go? Who should I ask? Well, I was asking some of my colleagues who specialize in this field Speech pathologists, where would they go? Today, with the NDIS and the fragmentation of, of services through education and health and disability, we actually admitted that if we were children or grandparents, uh, we were parents or grandparents of children with communication disability, we would not know where to go. The system has become so complex. There are so many doors to knock on for advice and support for children's communication. And so one of the things that I want to share with you today are some ideas of mine, um, because I'm allowed to be, it's a provocation series. Um, I think we could do things much more simply and learn from other countries. Family members of mine, spend, uh, work with children all day and spend until 11 o'clock at night. And in fact, Julie is <laughs> um, one of the people in Bathurst who does this and, and travels across the central west of New South Wales, fills out so many forms to advocate for children to receive services for a range of disabilities, but including uh, children with communication disabilities. I think the amount of time and energy and effort is currently spent on advocacy could actually be spent on doing something. There is just too much paperwork. Parents, 
back, this journal article is from 2002. Parents talk about the continuous fight. Now, if you have a think about children with communication disability, for many families, it's inherited. So if you have a child with a communication disability, you possibly do yourself. If you have to fight bureaucracies of many different types, and you don't have communication skills yourself, is your child going to get the support that they need? And then, exactly, well, almost exactly nine years ago, there was a National Senate inquiry by the Australian government. And one of three major concerns about Australia's ability to communicate that they listed, they only listed three concerns, was waiting for speech pathology, long waiting lists in the public sector. It hasn't changed. It's gotten worse. In fact, we um, had a New South Wales Health Translational Research Grant and we talked to, via quant, um, a survey and some online um, descriptive work, to 264 speech pathologists in the survey and 187 who actually wrote about their thoughts. What's it like being a speech pathologist managing this? It's a disgrace, but we can't speak about it. Many people, because of who they work for, actually can't talk about the fact that they feel anxious, stressed, embarrassed, overwhelmed, and leave the profession. The people we need to be working are spending so much time and energy managing waiting lists. This is a problem. There are some amazing workforce strategies that are happening across the universities and across Speech Pathology Australia to make sure there are many speech pathologists, wonderful ones in Australia, but they all are getting funneled into private practice to work for NDIS and fill out NDIS paperwork. So, although there were many doors to knock on for advice and support for children's communication, the services are fragmented. There are very long waiting lists and, oh, you can't actually see, but I don't mind where the television has actually split. I had the line through the word early, but in fact, the line has now gone through the whole thing of early intervention. Intervention is not early. If you have a year, and in fact, um, the longest waiting list when we interviewed speech pathologists was three and a half years. If you have to wait for three and a half years for services, you are not going to get early intervention, are you? It is way too late. Imagine not being able to talk to your capacity for three and a half years. That is too long. This problem isn't just Australia's. In fact, the World Report on Disability, published by the World Health Organization in 2011, said, we have counted people with disability in the world. 15% of people in the world have a disability. However, on page 22, they said, people with communication difficulties may not be included in these estimates of disability, despite encountering difficulties in daily life. So, it's more than 15%, but nobody looks at page 22. Back in 20, uh, 2010, um, I worked with a colleague from CSU at the time. She's um, been in Manchester and now just moved to be the head of education in um, Queensland, I think, UQ, Fran Press. And we wrote a paper called The Invisibility of Children with Communication Impairment in Australian Health, Education and Disability Legislation and Policies. I would like to say it's actually getting worse than it was in 2010. Now, I know you can't read this, but this is the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992 that is now used by um, education. Uh, thank you, Julie. I'm liking you nodding. <laughs> um, this is used as the main definition of disability in Australia. The closest we get to anything to do with communication in this definition is a disorder or malfunction that results in the person learning differently from a person without the disorder or malfunction. That is the closest we get to communication. Now, why does this matter? 
The nationally consistent collection of data on school students with disability uses that definition from 1992 and has categorised those into physical, cognitive, sensory and social emotional. That's how they count children with disability in school. Those children, um, the latest data that I could find from 2017, cognitive is the largest area of difficulty, physical, sensory is the smallest, and social emotional. Now, the word speech actually does appear, yay, in the NCCD. Guess which category it appears under? Have a guess. You were at home. This is my husband. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> he was listening. <laughs> okay. Sensory at point seven. Why is speech put under sensory? Have a think. Who are they counting? People with hearing loss. 1992. There were a lot of... That was... Well, that's still in the days where we remember before we were having our rubella injections for kids who became deaf from having rubella. That doesn't happen anymore. Okay, so here's proof. It says here, 63% of all students with a sensory and or speech disability experience difficulty at school. That's where they've put communication, under sensory. It's the smallest category. No, it is not. So, let me talk about what's going on. Basically, the government believes <laughs> in their definitions of disability that communication must be a secondary disability. Secondary to autism, secondary to hearing loss, secondary to cleft lip and palate, secondary to cerebral palsy. In fact, surgery has come so far for kids with cleft lip and palate that many don't even need speech therapy anymore. Cochlear implants are so amazing that many need the teeniest bit of speech therapy. But the group of kids that have communication as a primary disability are still here. They're the ones, that 25%, that the parents are concerned about their talking and making speech sounds. They're not talking like the other kids. They can't get the message across. They get frustrated. They can't communicate in the way that they would like them to. Many of the children encountered by speech pathologists, educators and other professionals have a primary communication disability. Now, I do a lot of work in America and in fact, our research is used, our research that we've done in Australia is used a lot in American policy. The IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act for the whole school system defines a child with a disability is somebody, a child with a disability has an intellectual disability, hearing impairment, including deafness, and I just made this a little large, they don't make it quite as large as I did, a speech or language impairment, and then they go on. Do you know what? Speech or language impairments were the most prevalent category for children ages three to five in IDEA. 44% of all kids with disability in America Ha were categorised as having speech and language impairment. And then when you get to school, the school age kids, for kids six through to 21, it was 17.9%. It was the second most prominent category. Why is Bill Shorten pulling his hair out? Because everybody's being diagnosed with autism at the moment. Now this is a little bit controversial. It's very important. I am so pleased that kids with autism are actually finally getting the support that they need. But I think that there might be a few kids in that category that might have autism or they might just have a primary communication disability. Now, I don't mind, quite frankly, if that's how they're going to get support. <laughs> this is a provocative lecture. So I'm saying this because they're going to get support that they need. That's fantastic. But the system's broken. 
we need new solutions. And luckily, many people are working on these solutions. Today, we met to begin our journey of, it's going to have a much better name, but the Global Regional Policy Futures at Charles Sturt. So those of you who came in um, and ended up in a photograph, uh, the first photograph was of the people working in the workshop today and tomorrow. And the people who came in for the second photograph, you are sure going to know about it because there's, you are going to be part of it as well um, in the future. So we are really working on new policies. As I said, in December, we ran our second ever Early Childhood Voices Conference. We ran the first one in 2020 and then in 2022. And we had 101 free presentations from 25 countries. We had almost 2,000 registrations from 72 countries. And actually, yes, let me do the maths. Oh, it was over 10,000 views of our work um, in December. That work, that thinking, that international thinking about children and doing well for the world's children is happening right here, but also across the whole world. So let's finish the last phase of this talk. We're not quite at the end, but some solutions. So here are just some solutions. Oh my goodness, it was hard to just choose four, but I thought four is enough for tonight. So the first thing that I want to talk about is how we can support communication for all children. Because some of you didn't come for a policy talk or a provocation, you came to get ideas about what to do with your children right now. So solution one, Use evidence-based practices to support all children's communication. And evidence-based practices are what we have been doing for millennia, regardless of which language or culture we come from. Talk, play, sing and read. So here's a paper that we um, wrote as a result of again investigating what happens in the longitudinal study of Australian children. Infants, one to two years of age, whose parents read with them for 11 minutes or more per day. Have a think how long 11 minutes is. It's not that long, is it really? Had much stronger reading, spelling and grammar skills in grades three and five. Oh my goodness, 11 minutes is such a short time. Did you realise? Did you realise? I, yeah, I know that you read more than 11 minutes a day. I've seen you. <laughs> um, did you realise the profound impact that that can have on kids? And this was published in the Early Childhood Research Quarterly. Those of you who are into it, a Q1 journal, one of our top quality early childhood journals in the world from America. So we had to do this research right. As well as working with the Longitudinal Study of Australian Children, we've also done a lot of work and gone to Canberra to collaborate with the, um, the linguists and the Indigenous people who have put together the Longitudinal Study of Indigenous Children for Australia. And this study is just amazing. They have identified 11 sites across Australia um, and looked longitudinally at children. This particular analysis, we compared 692 kids at three to five and then um, those children at, um, at five to seven, and we were able to follow 570 kids. One of the really lovely and different things about the families in the longitudinal study of Indigenous children is the number of people in children's lives who talk, play, sing and read with them. So parents, siblings, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, teachers and friends told, read and listened to stories 
in the indigenous languages, in the foreign languages, because, for example, the groups in Darwin are speaking, there's a lot of people who speak Greek, for example, um, in sign languages, and there are indigenous Australian sign languages. I don't know if you know that. They also played music, craft, shopping, drawing, cooking, and swimming. And in fact, it was swimming that you were more likely to speak an indigenous language in than any of the other activities. These clever kids spoke between one and eight languages. None of the kids that I have worked with throughout the world speak up to eight languages. But our clever Indigenous kids in this study, there are some that are speaking up to eight languages. We get a lot of bad press in the media about Indigenous kids, but there's some amazing things going on. Another group to think about supporting all children's communication using evidence-based practices, we've just finished the Viet speech study. Now, this was an Australian Research Council discovery grant where we worked with um, Vietnamese English-speaking children. We began the research just before COVID lockdown, so we ended up having to run our super speech program online. Initially, we thought that was going to be terrible with all of these um, kids who were um, preschoolers. How do you engage bilingual preschool kids in a bilingual program? So first of all, we posted everybody capes so that they knew they had to put on their superhero cape when it was time to engage with our Charles Sturt University team. Then we sent them packages of materials and books and activities. It was fantastic. When we did the analysis, we found out that it was actually much better to do it online because in many of the kids' homes, there were up to nine people participating off camera. <laughs> Because it was so much fun. <laughs> so yay. <laughs> so we're going to continue doing things online for that group. And in fact, the Vietnamese government and many others are working with us to upscale this work. But the take home message is we've done so much research to show that even if you are concerned about your child's talking and making speech sounds, even if your child has a diagnosed communication disability, it is so important to keep speaking all the languages that are important to that child because that is their identity, that is their relationships. And in fact, in many cases, that is where they had the most rich communicative interactions. It's Ramadan right now, so I would think that most of the people who are celebrating Ramadan are not here tonight or online, and I'm very sad about that. But in fact, hopefully those children have not been told to only speak English because they've got a communication disability. Hopefully, they've been told to maintain all of their rich cultural heritage so that they can participate beautifully in Ramadan. It is so important, and we have so much information about how multilingualism is a superpower. We've got work for parents of any language, but particularly if there's any of you who have an interest in Vietnamese English. We've done so much work in Vietnam too, and our Vietnamese um, colleagues. And in fact, Audrey is right up the back. She is this superhero. Audrey, just give everybody a wave. <laughs> it's lovely to have you here tonight, Audrey, supporting. And Audrey is a psychologist and um, has worked at Charles Sturt for eight years. She's not working with us anymore, but um, we go for walks every Tuesday because I can't miss out on Audrey time. And Audrey and Mark have given us lots of great insight into how multilingualism is a superpower for them. Okay, the other things are shorter, but I just really wanted to speak to those of you who are parents and grandparents and so forth. The second idea, the second solution is to provide integrated but not fragmented services for education, health, disability and private practice. Remember I began by saying 25% of parents are concerned about how their child talks and makes speech sounds. So why are we filling out all this paperwork to say that there are some kids who need speech therapy? Do you know what happens on these expert panels and committees that I sit in? When they do the analysis and when 
teachers, par- uh, teachers, parents, well, not usually parents actually, teachers and principals can be frank and honest and off the record. They say, we are so thankful that there are two children in the class that got NDIS support because whoever comes in gets to see the 10 others that didn't get NDIS support. It's ridiculous. In countries such as the US, in Canada, the UK, and some parts of Australia, speech pathologists are employed in every school. Education is the biggest employer of speech pathologists in the US. In Canada, every single kindergarten does not have one teacher. It has one teacher plus a specialist support person, whether it's a specialist teacher or a speech pathologist or somebody in their school. So why waste all this time and energy on paperwork? Just give kids more support. Give the teachers more support. Help our kids thrive. Get speech pathologists instead of being in their clinics that Parents have to organise their work day to go off and pick up their kids and go off somewhere else for a half an hour session. Put us where children are. Children have asked us for us to have big listening ears to them. We can't listen to them well if they come to us in a place that's not familiar to them. They are frightened. They are worried. Is this lady going to give me a a, a needle? When I go to places like this, I usually get a needle or something terrible happens. Then, you know, we are very good as speech pathologists getting kids to talk, quite frankly. Um, But it takes a while to get them to warm up. Why not have us right there in amongst everybody? Why not have us watch what has led this little guy to say... They don't let me play. This little guy was asked in one of our ARC discovery projects to draw yourself talking to somebody. The one before said he loved talking to people with big listening ears. This little one said, they don't let me play. I can't draw anybody talking to me because they don't let me play. We need to be there. We need to find out what's going on. We need to come up with and work with these amazing teachers to provide support, extra hands, evidence-based solutions to changing this kid's life. We want kids to draw this picture. This little one who also had a communication disability was talking about how she thrived because they did let her play. So, I would like to advocate for universal access to speech pathologists and specialist educators in early childhood education settings and particularly the early years of school, but those kids who've missed out on communication uh, exposure due to COVID particularly, there's a particular cohort that countries like the UK, and Australia has done this to some extent, but not focusing on communication particularly, there's a cohort of our kids who've really missed out by being at home during COVID lockdown. So the next two solutions are much shorter. Provide enough intervention. Now, as I say, there are many, many, many evidence-based interventions to support children with communication disability to thrive. These are just a couple of ones that I've been involved in. I specialise in children's speech. Others specialise in developmental language disorder. Others specialise in kids who stutter. Others specialise in kids who have voice disorders, who need uh, augmentative and alternative communication or AAC. There are many specialty areas that have particular interventions that require particular amounts of time. But an overarching thing is that six hours of therapy is not enough. According to this randomised controlled trial that was published in the British Medical Journal in the year 2000, we have known this for, well, ever, but this paper absolutely got so much press and media. What year is it right now? 2023. This is very old news. We, as part of a New South Wales Health Grant, actually set up a Waiting for Speech Pathology website that's on New South Wales Health website. It's part of the translational research grant funding. 
We looked to see if the website made any difference to kids' speech, intelligibility, language literacy, parental empowerment and parental satisfaction. Nope. The randomised controlled trial said it did nothing. I'm sure, and we still use it, it's still useful. But in terms of actually making meaningful clinical change, a website does nothing. We also provided these kids intervention. And we provided them 12 sessions of intervention. Did that make a difference? Absolutely. Finally, my final solution is count all children with communication disability, not just the ones with communication disability as a secondary disability, but ones with a primary disability. Last night, my husband heard this on the radio. So I don't know where, who it's from, but, <laughs> so I, I feel terrible, but it was just so fabulous that I thought I'm going to include this. So thank you whoever on the radio said this. What gets measured gets monitored. What gets monitored gets valued. I think that some of our problems with our disability funding, with our kids, with behaviour difficulties, with learning difficulties, with literacy difficulties, are because we are not counting these kids. They are invisible. I want to end with this quote from 1926. How long ago is this quote? 1926, do the maths? A long time, almost 100 years ago. Children are not the people of tomorrow, but are the people of today. They have a right to be taken seriously and to be treated with tenderness and respect. They should be allowed to grow into whoever they're meant to be. The unknown person inside of them is our hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That was fantastic. Um, and look, I, I should say the first time I met Sharon, um, she told me that she didn't do policy. She doesn't do policy. Um, that, that was wonderful. And that, for our first provocation, um, the idea of communication as a, as a democratic right and, and value, um, I think that's just so wonderful, isn't it? Um, so look, um, we, I think we should have 10 minutes for questions at least. I know we're coming to the end of our, of our time. Um, so um, I have some questions here for you. Um, some are coming through Slido. Um, but first, um, a question. Sharon, uh, you're an inspiration. Um, how have you been able to achieve such remarkable work with such a heavy teaching load? <laughs> Who of my colleagues just... <laughs> well, do you know what? Thank you to Kevin Rudd. Back in 2007, he initiated the ARC Future Fellows Scheme. In 2009, Gary Luck from Charles Sturt University and I were in the first cohort of being an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. That gave me four years and it ended up due to a whole range of things. I had five years where the only students that I lectured were my PhD students and then guest lectures at CSU and across the world, but I didn't have a teaching load. And I visited and worked with many of these people. That is what has set me on this path to be able to achieve. I am so grateful. And now, um, Jane, there we go. Jane, if it, just stand up so people can see you. The scheme has developed, so now it has a DECRA, a Discovery Early Career um, Award and a Laureate 
Um, so either end as well. Um, the laureates are for the end of your career. I'm really hoping I get one of those too. Um, but that, that actually changed my life. It changed my ability to do this. And I'm very grateful that at different times I've been able to win grants and awards so that I can manage both my teaching and um, so forth. But I do work with the most remarkable and clever students at Charles Sturt, if I can say that, because almost every one of my eight current PhD students has not had a parent who has attended university. And those students, and, and I've only actually ever had one student whose dad had a PhD and he got it about a month before she did. I love working with students at CSU because they are not traditional. They do not think in traditional ways. They are so creative. They are so embedded. And CSU, thanks to people like Emmeline here, has the most amazing research support. Emmeline's in charge of uh, support for our higher degree research students across the world. And because all of our students can be um, in whatever country. I have had PhD students doing their whole PhDs living in Fiji, and that's why I get the most authentic, fantastic research. So a long answer, but um, there you go. <laughs> so another question, what, what can we all do to get this issue on the policy agenda? Um, ask Mark. <laughs> I don't know, that's why we're collaborating and working in the next two days. I don't know, what do you think, Mark? Well, what do you think, anybody here? Please help. Well, we can't wait for government to take action, and we need to insist that government takes action. We need to be active citizens advocating um, in support of these, these children. Um, we're, we're too reliant and dependent on government. We need to seize the day as citizens and make the change ourselves. That would be my, my, my view. I look forward to working with you on it. Anytime <laughs> anybody, anybody, rings me up and says, can I talk? Our local radio station, ABC Radio. I was on drive time with Virginia Trioli. I, I don't care. I will talk to them about this issue again and again and again. Maybe somebody will listen. What are you going to do next um, in terms of your <laughs> research agenda? <laughs> work with Mark, <laughs> work with his policy institute and actually be much more purposeful um, and less ad hoc at the policy piece. The other thing is that my colleagues and I have developed the most amazing ability to listen to people that most people don't listen to because they don't know how to. Um, and people like Julian and Libby and, um, and Suzanne Hoff and I are in a Sturt, uh, you know, Sturt scheme program um, called the Early Childhood Interdisciplinary Sturt Scheme. And we have been working together with our amazing colleagues who are in it too, and I can see a bunch of you in the room, to, um, to make sure that um, we listen to children. I would actually love to have an expert panel of rural children um, actually giving us advice. So, yeah, I, I'm really keen on enabling children's voices to be heard much more. Uh, a question from Dr. Susan Pond. Marion, that was terrific. You, you mentioned this 20, 25% of children, and one of the possible earlier interventions is 11 minutes of reading. What's the work being done to reduce that 20% by earlier and earlier diagnosis, if that's the mm. correct term and so intervention. There's some really good initiatives at the moment that the government has, um, and I'm just aware of people like um, Leanne here, um, the government has a real commitment to children attending uh, free universal early childhood education and care uh, for 
varying amounts of time and money and you will have seen things. This is marvellous because some children don't have a lot of books in their homes, whereas um, early childhood education and care centres do. You know, there are play, it doesn't have to all be parents reading, um, but there are some amazing evidence-based um, resources and practices that happen in, uh, isn't it South Australia that parents get a big bunch of books when you have a baby? Um, there's really clever things going on. Every state and territory does it differently. And I would just love to combine all the amazing things that are going on. GPs actually have questions about speech and language when they give their four-year-old immunisation. But when I talk to GPs, they say, parents say they're worried, but then we don't know what to do. And especially for the ones that speak a range of languages, we don't know if that's meaningful or not. We, on our CSU website, have a questionnaire in over 70 languages that tells you if they get a score of four or lower, you worry. If they get higher than four, they're fine. Like, we've done so much work with incredible people around the world. We need to bring all of that together. That's the thing. There's some really clever and evidence-based solutions, but every state, territory, region, <laughs> little group of informed citizens is doing something good, and the rest, you know, they're doing their best. Let's bring it together. Have we any more uh, questions from the, the floor to end with? No? Oh, Mark. Oh, I have to wait for the, uh, the mic so people can hear you on, on, online. Oh, thanks, Sharon. Can I just also say just how proud we are of you and your work? It's just uh, wonderful to <laughs> have this presentation. Um, my question is this. Um, so when student or children um, receive the support that they need, how much of a difference does it make to bringing them up to where they, they, they perhaps should be? Uh, and how quickly does that um, benefit really kick in? So the benefit can really kick in for some kids after about 12 sessions, and then they're just fine, especially if they're little, especially if they're three, you know? And it can really make a huge difference. If, if kids are struggling with their talking and making speech sounds when they're three, and they come and see a speech pathologist for, it, I mean, it'd be great if it was like two terms. That might be the difference between whether they can learn to read or not. It's, for some kids, it's that straightforward, but they get put on a waiting list for a year, and then they're told they can only have six sessions, and they don't get enough. And so they end up having remedial reading in year one, when it could all have been the trajectory could have been changed, and there's a lot of literature to show that. One of the other things that I would love is almost every time I go on ABC radio, somebody who talks to me, whether it's a producer or the, actually the interviewer, quietly says, but never actually says on the radio, you know, I used to go to speech therapy as a child. And I think, yes, success. <laughs> but those people are not talking about it. So we don't see all that success. So that's another um, book idea that I'm really keen to write. It's on one of my to-do lists of writing the success stories. So families can have such great hope and knowledge that work is worth it, but you can't do it quickly. You can't, if you want to learn to kick a football, you can't just go out and go have a couple of kicks. Speech and language requires motor planning. You've got to actually change how your mouth works. You've got to do it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Like learning the piano, like learning to type, like, you know, you've got to practice to undo patterns and make different patterns for the speech side of things. You've got to change the filing systems in your brain for the language stuff. It's not quick like the government would like it to be. It's not quick and cheap. So, yes, they're amazing success stories, but because they are successful, we don't hear that what happened as children. Let's 
Think of our people of tomorrow and today. All those children that you saw at the beginning, those Wiradjuri children, those children in Bathurst, those children in the Central West, those children in New South Wales, Australia and the world. Let's do the right thing by them. So look, it just remains for me to say, you know, thank you to Sharon for a, a, what I would call a magical uh, provocation. Uh, and we're certainly with you. Um, many thanks to Dr. Susan Pond and to the Royal Society of New South Wales for their support for this event. Uh, we look